with the fact that we will be recording today. Um, and we will upload this recording to our YouTube channel uh, that you can access uh, probably in the next week or so. So the um, certificate of attendance, we'll send a I'll send that out later today and we do value your feedback and ask you to complete an evaluation for today's event. I'll send that link out immediately after the event. Um, and as an incentive to get those done quickly, we do offer a $25 gift card if you complete the evaluation. Uh, you have a chance at a $25 gift card if you complete before 5 p.m. today. So we welcome Deborah Stanley and Baye Sylvester. Uh, from Imani Unidad, and thank you both for being with us today uh, to speak about this really important topic of trauma and the Black experience. So Deborah Stanley has served the South Bend community since 1992 as an educator, advocate, trainer, collaborator, and consultant. She is founder and executive director of Imani Unidad, whose mission is to infuse social justice into social and behavioral health. Armin Baye Sylvester is a long-term resident of this community. Baye began as a grassroots organizer on the streets of Milwaukee, Cleveland, and Chicago. Returning to South Bend, he was a violence interventionist with Ceasefire and later a facilitator and outreach worker with Companions on the Journey Reentry Program as a certified forensic peer specialist, support specialist and community health worker, Baye works with the team in St. Joseph County Problem Solving Court and is lead facilitator and group coordinator for Peer to Peer. We thank you both for being with us today to speak about this important topic. So I don't know which one of you is gonna be speaking first. Um, I'll, I'll um, initiate this. Uh, can you all hear feedback? No. Okay, great. All right. Well, um, first of all, I just want to say that I am much thrilled for the opportunity to talk about this subject and hope, hoping that out of this here will further discussion and enable those listening to be able to um, just share some insight when they're in, involved in the conversation outside of this here medium. Um, what I want to do today is to give some information, you know, and hopefully, like I say, stir some uh, up some dialogue. What I don't want to do is for anyone to think that this is the last word on the subject or to, um, to, to just think that, you know, this is, we present this here outside of its connecting this to everything else in the community. So to start. Okay, historical trauma. Historical trauma is not about the past, it's about the present. You know, I, I put that there because I think it's important for us to understand that the dilemmas and the realities of which we find in the black community should, is something that we should not be um, really surprised about if we understand what, from, uh, what historical trauma is. In order, to better understand the implications of trauma in the Black community, we must also look at the intersections of history and historical trauma and how it may be impacting community responses and interpersonal relationships, communication, and ongoing microaggressions from society. Every day we pick up the newspaper, turn on the news, or just answer the telephone, there usually is some um, some comment about violence in our community. This violence in our community is not something that's just happening out of osmosis. This is, has a direct correlation to events of the past. And as I move forward through these slides, we'll be able to talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit more in depth about the, um, the ongoing assaults of black on black violence, domestic violence, and where the impetus for these things come from. A historical trauma, getting back to that, is an event, go back there, no, is an event or a series of events that happens to a group of people that share a specific identity. 
which results in significant disruption of traditions, culture, and identity. This is the reality for African people, not just in the US, but in the Western hemisphere. And in certain, and in, in particular, it also speaks to the, um, the settler colonialism that took place on the continent of Africa. The, um, the slaves in, in the US represents chattel slavery as we know it, but we consider that there to be domestic colonialism as we were brought here and domesticated to serve um, in, the, in the capacity as chattel slavery. In this case, we are talking specifically about the traumas experienced by Blacks in America. When we talk about slavery, when we talk about the Civil War, segregation and Jim Crow, all are examples of historical traumas. Now, as learned individuals, we know that any trauma, whether it be a car accident or some child being uh, fearful in the night by something that may happen, these things have residual effects. And when we think about historical trauma, it's just uh, magnified exponentially. Individually, these events were profoundly traumatic, and when viewed as a whole, they represent a history of sustained community devastation. Sustained community devastation. Why is that important? It's important because when we look at what African life was like prior to the interruption, I'm going to talk about the interruption of being colonized and invaded by foreigners. You know, African civilization was no different than any other civilization. They prospered, they discovered, they had their own sense of spirituality, and so on and so forth. So with that backdrop, we move forward. A tyrannical system, systematic oppression of black people for profit. Traumatic events that overwhelm the ordinary systems of care that give us a sense of control, connection, and meaning. The deprivation, the denial of a people being able to use their tongue, their language to communicate. The denial of an opportunity to express oneself spiritually in the sense or in the way that they were used to. These are things that has had long lasting effects on the black community and which continue to, to, to interrupt our meaningful ability to communicate interpersonally and to move forward in a community of which we find ourselves today, specifically America. An overwhelming experience where we lose our connection with what is safe. The accumulation of trauma that Black people carry in their bodies as a result of 400 years of forceful submission, helplessness, bondage, and emotional and physical overwhelm. That is, is, is a lot to digest. That is something that a cursory review in, in, the, in, the, in the time that we have right now to talk about this here, I could not give justice to. There are countless studies. There are countless evidence of how this have affected present day life in America for black people. The psychosocial impact of collective trauma, collective trauma. That's the microaggressions, that's the ongoing onslaught of what's happened to us. African-Americans have endured centuries of harms and as with the past, tensions have boiled over as witnessed in the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. This type of historical trauma is called post-traumatic slave syndrome. Now, when Dr. Joy DeGruy um, first intimated this here and, and presented this here to the, um, to, to the world, in fact, there was some pushback on it. There's always people from the dominant society, uh, especially in academia, who says, okay, where's the proof of this here? We only have to look to um, the studies that was done post-Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, to see where on the cellular level, oppression, degradation, and stress can be passed on. The result of PTSS is adaptive behaviors that are essentially survival mechanisms employed by African-Americans, which are passed down generationally. These um, survival mechanisms show themselves in different ways. They show themselves in, 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 in countless um, accounts of black on black crime. They sold themselves in countless accounts of those individuals from the uh, African-American community finding it hard to believe that they can successfully, you know, uh, move through academia 
in, in, in the hurdles that they have to jump over and convincing one another that it can be done. These circumstances are all detrimental to mental and emotional health. These circumstances are all detrimental to mental and emotional health. Epigenetics. The term epigenetics is one that when I use it, a lot of people ask me, well, what are you talking about? When we know that genetics has to do with the genome, I mean, when we're talking about the epigenetics, we are talking about how the experiences of previous generations can affect who we are. Epigenetics research on historical, go back, please. Epigenetics research on historical trauma reveals how the felt trauma of these events is held internally and passed down to future generations. Embedded in our DNA is the, the, the stress, the anger, the hurt, the pain that generations before us have felt. And, it, and, it's, and it's in there and you can see this here. They have countless studies now showing that there are individuals who survived Holocaust who remember smelling the burning of the bodies, the incinerations, and where their children and their grandchildren are having expressed, you know, uh, uh, mental and emotional disorders. And when they are have the opportunity to, to meet with professionals, this is what comes out. And this is not just particular to one set of individuals. This happens across the board. The impact of historical trauma has effects on a person's brain and body, increasing their vulnerability to anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other mental health conditions. Now, in the Black community for so long, to even mention about someone should see a professional mental health uh, or a mental health professional, the first thing they would tell you is that I'm not crazy. And that ties into the distrust of institutions. Trauma can cause a lifetime of hypervigilance and flashbacks and result in a myriad of secondary psychological conditions, including depression, mood disorders, psychosomatic issues, and substance abuse. All of the things which have been rampant in our community. And we ask, many of us, we ask one another, well, what's going on? Why can't we get it together? Why are we so quick to act on one another? These are things that were, that were passed on generationally from where slave owners pitted one person against another, or I had to, to, to harm someone, to protect another loved one, or to protect myself. And it shows itself out in these microaggressions in our community on a daily basis. Stress, the number one causation for poor health outcomes is rampant in our community. While whites get treatment and compassion, blacks get labeled, discarded, and criminalized. And like I said earlier, let me qualify this here again. This is not to make someone feel, or any of you feel some kind of way about this information in terms of offended by it, but it's just the truth. And it's a truth that's not necessarily, you know, for your benefit, this is messages that, that the black community needs to hear if we are going to move forward with regards to addressing how we deal with these things. Move forward then. What are we seeing now? creation of an infor, inf, inferiority and dependent culture, hypermasculinity. We see our young men, they are quick to be with the bravado. They're quick to dismiss one another to the extent of eliminating one another. We have internalized depression and extreme levels of learned helplessness. I can't do that there. I don't, if I go to school, I got to go to school to learn how to cook because I don't have the capacity to be able to, to work with numbers or technology. That's learned helplessness. We are constantly being faced with mass incarceration. We all are familiar now with from the schoolyard to the prison yard, that prison pipeline. So when we talk about these things, we have to look at it. We have genocidal practices that have been not just leveled against Black people, but other people, but we're talking about Black people. But out of that genocidal practices of which we struggled against and we survived to this day, we are now faced with the reality of fratricide. Now, many of you, if you look that term up, it's going to say the killing of one's brother. 
But in this instance, I use that, that, that word because when you look at it across this country, the majority, the vast majority of homicides, you know, against black people are, are you know, put forth by black people. That's misguided frustration. That's misguided frustration. And it's because of the dehumanizing and the, the, the devaluing of life in the black community, which is a learned behavior. And if it's not fratricide, then it's suicide. When we talk about this statement at the end, I'm going to beat your ass so that, so that the police of the massa don't get you. Here it is, we can be in a learning env uh, um, environment and someone, some parent may say to me, oh, little, little Malik, he's so smart and this and that there. And I might say, oh, but let me tell you, you know, he's a half fool at home and this and that there. And, he, and that's carried over from the days of slavery when I had to play down that my child was vibrant and strong because I was fearful that he would be sold from up under me. This is our reality. Move forward, man. Okay. <laughs> so these, oh, okay, did I go? Okay, where do I go? I'm oh shoot. My little things, am I un, I'm unmuted, but my little things, oh here they go. I want to go forward. Okay, so here we are, <clears throat> because not only uh, Abaye talked about some of the misguided frustrations within our community, but there are misguided frustrations within the power structure, mm -hmm. those things that we are challenged by that cause those everyday stressors that are lead to our adverse health outcomes. This whole notion that just merely being a black man on this planet is a threat to all of humanity. Uh, it's, it's, it's just how, how people get away with harms to us, but just the threatening of black men. That's why they don't advance in the in corporate America. That's why they aren't promoted in the factories and things like that, that they are just looked at as a threat. And even how women are pitted against men in the workplace, women will be promoted long before a man will. Flip that and black women are intimidating. You know, you have that whole notion of the angry black female, but we are, when we are self-confident, when we can speak our minds, for some reason, it's defined as intimidating. Uh, for us to require respect, when we are accessing services, when we are out here in this world, when we require respect from the world, we are then labeled as non-compliant. Uh, I, I, I think of the story of my father <laughs> who at one point needed some visiting nurses to his home. And the first nurse came into his home and he smoked and she told him that uh, he couldn't smoke because she didn't like cigarette smoke. And he told her to get out of his house, okay. And so then they sent another nurse. This nurse came, she refused to look at him as a person. She looked at the ceiling, she looked at the floor, she looked at the lamp, but she would refuse to look at him. And so he told her that, again, that whole threatening black male told her not to come back to his house again. And so when we go back and we try to get another nurse, we found out he was labeled non-compliant and they didn't want to provide the services anymore. And so again, we require respect, we demand respect. It is not non-compliance, it is our job, it is our responsibility as human beings to demand that from this world. This whole attempt to erase who we are our contributions, our culture, our language off the planet. <laughs> you know, even you, we talk to African students who are here going to school. 
And they can tell you, even in their country, they learn Dutch history, they learn French history, they learn history. They do not learn the history of country, their own contributions. And so we see that in the history of us, when we go to school, uh, we had a representative a, a, a serving on the national front go on national television and say that Europeans are the only people who have ever contri contributed to civilization. And that's a belief system ingrained into our institutions. That whole thing called religion. Oh my goodness. <laughs> when the missionaries came, we had the land, they had the Bible. They taught us to pray with our eyes closed. When we opened our eyes, they had the land and we had the Bible. One of the biggest tools of the oppressor against people of color, indigenous people has been religion. That's why the missionaries always come first with the indoctrination and the pretension of peace. Codification in law, the murder, rape, theft, and theft of our material goods. That was the bargain at Bacon's Rebellion. The first, the first uprising on this continent after Europeans got here. Governor Bacon uh, was, was, was in charge. White indentured servants looked around and they saw that their lot was no better than African slaves. And so they formed an alliance and they revolted against Governor Bacon. Well, what happened is Governor Bacon was sent back to Europe. Thomas Jefferson in his writings explains how they discovered something at that time. And what they did was they made a bargain. They made a bargain with white people. We will not share the wealth with you. You will still be poor. Your children will still be hungry. But what we will do is codify in law your superiority to people of color. We will codify in the law your ability to rape them, to murder them, to steal everything they have. That's the bargain. Today, you still see that played out. And so we can talk about Black Wall Street, we can talk about Rosewood, we can talk about communities right here in Indiana where white people lined up across the street and just fired weapons until every Black person was dead and then they claimed their land as their own. And so again, the poverty that we experience today has its roots, its history in those kind of codified laws. Traumatization of our youth. We see our young people now trying to get online, trying to use the internet. You see adults coming into online chat rooms where Black youth are and spewing all kinds of hatred and uh, against them. When we look at things like school resource officers, Baye mentioned the school to prison pipeline. Well, that's a design. You see these school resource officers in the school criminalizing, arresting our black youth. Criminalization of youth culture. Oh my God, when, you, when we think about we uh, the history of our, our singing groups, Temptations, Four Tops, they can all talk about how they used to stand on street corners under the street lights, and that's how they got their starts. Well, today, loitering, after they shut down anywhere and everywhere youth have to go, loitering now becomes against the law. And right here in South Bend, I can remember when they closed down West Washington Street and pushed everybody to the far west side, they tried to implement loitering laws right here in South Bend. We remember how when rap came out and rap was this whole educational process that talked really honestly about our conditions, they tried to make it illegal. Sagging pants, a cultural phenomenon of young people. They tried to criminalize it. The foster care system, 
putting our children into special ed, those kinds of things, again, constant and consistent traumatizing of our youth. And so we get to the point where we just ask the question, what are we to do with all of this truth and reality? And so we always have to have solutions. And one is the whole acknowledgement of the reality of post-traumatic slave syndrome. We have to acknowledge it is real, it is true. We as black people need to better align ourselves with others who have a strong sense of themselves. We are black members of and in community. We have to recreate these systems of caring for ourselves. Everybody needs to learn an in-depth and complete historical perspective of us. Our history did not begin with sl slavery. We have all, and th this is another thing that we need to be very, very honest about. We have all been horribly, horribly miseducated. Miseducated not only about black and brown and indigenous people, we have been miseducated about women. We have been miseducated about the LGBTQ community and how we have been taught to turn on one another. We as Black people need to develop a pan-African centered self. We need to understand that every Black skinned person on this planet is kin to us. Africa is a continent with many countries. And so we as descendants are just as varied. We come from agriculturists. We come from scientists. We come from kings and queens. We come from nomadic people. We come from people who were very stable. Uh, and so we have to acknowledge that. We aren't a monolithic society. We need to claim our power. We need to become active and let our voices be heard. And there are a whole lot of ways to do that. The activism that we saw after the killing of George Floyd was so very therapeutic for all of us. It meant that we could do something. We were doing something. But we don't all have to take to the streets. The whole just acknowledging our neighbors, saying good morning, keeping a smile on our face, shoveling the next door neighbor's snow. There are all kinds of things that we can do to be active. We need to seek peace within our own souls. That's a, 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 a serious accomplishment. And that so again, honoring our history, who we were, and our spiritual selves. And then there is what is the world gonna do? <laughs> so then it is very important for the world white people, institutions, these entities to put in the hard work of validating the experiences of non-white people. I, when I work with young people, with students, I always say that whoever is sitting in front of you at that moment is the most important person on this planet. It is so important to take time to listen to them to listen to them define themselves on their own terms, to say to, to us, who am I and what is it that I want for me? And our role then is to just help them get to where it is they want to go. White people need to explore and understand their own historical trauma. This whole notion that they have not been affected by the things that have happened on this planet if you stop and think about the fact that in those times of public lynchings, people used to cook up big meals. They used to come, it was a family gathering. They brought their children to those events. They sit down and they dined as people were tarred and feathered and set on fire. You think there's no trauma from that? As, as a woman, and again, I never knew the depth of, 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 of women hating women, white women who hate white women until Hillary Clinton ran for president. That was the best example of how white women hate white women. But they need to understand where that came from and their hatred of other black women. And I could share story after story of, of, of me and white women in this professional sphere. But if you think 
about it as a as a woman laying in your bed night after night after night mm -hmm. while your husband your father your son your brother is out in the slave quarter raping children both male and females raping adults male and female all the while telling you that these are heathens these are less than human and then well so what are you doing out there instead of with me every night and so again there is a historical trauma that folks need to look at in their own backyard create opportunities to to just be with others in their suffering and as, again opportunity to acknowledge your own suffering. In community, we need to be honest and change some thoughts, some language and actions in order not to further traumatize others. And intergenerational trauma is systemic. And so again, we urge everybody to go forth and work toward a systemic solution. All of these institutions that we work in are harmful. They in, inflict harm on others. And so again, to really question ourselves and look at what are we going to do to change these systems. And so Q&A time, we leave time for others. So um, we do have an entire library of resources. Uh, that we can share with others. We have bibliographies that people want to get things for themselves. Absolutely. So I don't have access, so I don't know how you go about oh. allowing people to ask questions. Well, um, I can actually, the chat box, there were a few things that came in, Deborah, if okay. I could read them to you. Yes, absolutely. So um, I, here's a comment. I like that the most, most important person, uh, that, what was the rest of that, Deborah? The most important person in, in the room or the most important person in this moment is the person sitting so in the, front of the you? The most important person in the world. So for all those of us in service to community, the most important person in the world is the person sitting before you at that moment. Important to take time to listen to their story, to believe their story, to trust their story, to allow them to define themselves on their own terms, to allow them to say who they are and what they want for themselves. And understand that, that again, not only how horribly we have been miseducated, the things that we have been taught, especially in the social sciences field, the social workers, psychologists, and all this whole distancing that we have in terms of humanity is harmful. It's harmful. It's re traumatizing. When people are out here coming to a therapeutic session looking for, striving for connectedness, human connectedness, and we are being taught to maintain this distance, <laughs> you know. And so while there is this whole thing as boundaries, yes, I understand that. But uh, I even had, had a provider tell me that they were taught it was unethical to continue to contact someone. So I, cause I was just asking the question. So uh, about retention, retention in care. So have you called them? Have you checked on them? Have you sent them a postcard? And, and I was told that that was ethically, told, that was ethically incorrect. And I said, I, I, I couldn't believe that, that it's, it, somebody is being taught that is unethical to say that I care. I understand ambulance chasing <laughs> and trying to make somebody take your services. And that's very different. That's very different than saying I care. There's a, a couple other questions that have come in. Yes. One is, how do we change the school to prison pipeline? SROs are part of the problem, but not the foundation of it. So again, institutionally, these harms are in place. So SROs come from the legislator. They, that's a legislated funded something. And so it's, it's, it's almost a legal requirement that SROs come into schools. But again, you can work within, 
your community. We question SROs here in our community, which is how we found out about them. And at one point, the school corporation pretended that they had no authority. The police department pretended they had no authority. And so again, it is up to community to say, well, if both of you are taking a handoff approach, then it is our authority. And we, because the whole goal of, of um, SROs is to foster relationships, you know, to be a support. We don't even understand why do you have to wear a gun into the school if you if the whole point is to foster relationship why not leave the guns the bullets the batons all of and the handcuffs all of those things at home you can still be a police officer but you can be there to do the intent and so again making it a requirement uh, a policy in the school corporation that a teacher cannot call an officer into her classroom to manage her class that's her job his job, whosoever that teacher is. And so again, making sure everybody stays in their own lane, you know, police officers, the SROs is not, their whole role is not to be police officers in the school. And so again, to become aware of those kinds of things and help to create, to shape the policies around those things. But again, to talk to when people are running for office, to talk to legislators who will say no to those kinds of things. You know, school board members, what's your policy on SROs in, in the schools? Yes. Can I, can I, 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 I feel like we could talk a lot more about that yes. um, as an intervention. <laughs> um, there are a lot of other questions that okay, have come in. So uh, you, you tell me if you want to stick with the topic or so if I jump to the next question, just stop me if, if you want to stay, say something more on it. No, no, so, no, I'm uh, go ahead to the next question. Okay. okay, so Sarah is asking, what are some specific things you can recommend that we therapists can do or not do to create safety for people who've been traumatized within the healthcare system? Hmm. Go ahead, we can both go, but go ahead. Okay, um, one of the things that, I, that I'm, firmly convinced that we can do is to allow people to own what they feel and to when they when they are sharing their past experiences that has been traumatic with them not to feel so compelled as a therapist to protect the institution but to validate the person and let the person know that institutions are made of people and that there are some people who bring their baggage when well, we all bring baggage with us and that they now have an opportunity to to while they're sitting in front of you to you know to experience something different something different and to ask of that person what would it look like to them to be validated what would it look like to them you know that would be something that would feel safe you know, for them and then try to move forward with that, hoping that, you know, you could, there will be some type of connection there that will could build trust. And providers have to understand. Uh, okay, so there are these power differentials in relationships. Okay, so people are coming to, to providers uh, as, as, as for their expertise. What we work with people is to help them to understand that it is an equal relationship because we, each and every one of us, is the experts on ourselves, our own lives, our own bodies, our own experiences, our own beliefs. That's where our expertise is. The provider cannot make a, a good recommendation to us without our expertise, our input into the relationship. So. Providers need to create, give up this whole notion of power, <laughs> create an atmosphere so that people can know that they are experts in their, the, on themselves and, and create this whole honest, honest relationship so that I can tell you absolutely everything I need for your best advisement. Um, how can we build a greater 
awareness of the impact of traumatic experiences on the Black community when providing direct clinical care to individuals, families, and the wider community. Could you repeat that one? How, can, how do we, or can we, mm -hmm. build greater awareness of the impact of traumatic experiences of the Black community when providing direct care, clinical care, to individuals, families, and the wider community. And I, I, I feel like you just were talking about that in terms mm -hmm. of acknowledging power um, and the power differential that's there. I, right. and, yes, and one of the other things is, is go forth and learn. So if you think about our, our educational system, you know, so, okay, so we are taught theoretical models of, you know, and so Rogers, Freud, M Masters, all white males, <laughs> you know, that's the predominant teachings is the theoretical models of white males. And so again, you have to pursue something different. You have to pursue the theoretical models of black folks, of brown folks, of women, of the LGBT community, you have to go and pursue their stories about their lives. And so, so again, there's this whole library, this whole field of work by folks that will never ever enter the classroom. If you think about how legislatively uh, Mitch Daniels said a people's history would never ever enter Indiana schools. How the 19, the 1999, that new project, that black, the history project that is now, how legislatively they are trying to stop any history but Eurocentric history from entering the classroom. And so it is something we have to pursue we have to say, no, I want to learn more, as well as learning from, again, that individual <laughs> sitting in front of you at that moment. I also think that, you know, if when, when dealing with, with, with community, people within the community itself has to return to that understanding that the past is the present is the future. OK, and that there is a specific need for us to recognize that home and community represents an institution as well. And while we are, you know, targeting these, these, these legislators and these larger institutions, it's important for us to create that space amongst ourselves. And as professionals, we have to convey that message, not in a a necessarily a uh, demeaning way that you know you do this or that there, but just to, to, to explain that there's value in that, in that they that we must find our voice in being able to, to, to express that there's a need that we have something to give to one another as well. There's a next question. Could you say a bit more about post-traumatic slave disorder? It makes sense that such is a reality, but I've never heard the term before today. Are you saying that uh, the traumatizes, uh, uh, I think the traumatic experiences endured by my slave forefathers are in some way a part of my psyche some five generations later? Ab absolutely, that's what we are saying, that, uh, that that one little example that 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 I gave of of a fear a fear so the the I'm gonna whoop your ass so that the master don't whoop your ass so that the police don't whoop your ass so that the so we learned to beat to beat our children as as a means of protection and sometimes that was required by the slave master as a form of subjugation of control, to beat, to beat, to beat. And to this day, we still hear that. I still hear people saying, well, I got my ass beat and I'm okay, but you don't see how you are unable to emotionally attach to others, how you have just kind of emotionally checked out because you had to endure that pain. And, and see, that's another thing, that whole, notion that 
we have black people have this whole high tolerance of pain uh that's something that's institutionalized that's how buy-in was gotten from the rest of society as acceptance of how we were treated by saying again that we did not feel pain that we could take it we i think also is is to add to what deborah was saying you know and i'm speaking to um communities of, of, of color and black people specifically is that this not this this notion this idea that we're resilient there is no resilience without a uh, residue okay and there's residue that attaches to slavery and any other kind of oppression especially if it's generational and in, in, in these microaggressions that you consistently feel if i go in a store and i may have on a suit and a tie and it's and, and can speak articulately but someone who's behind the counter would dismiss me and talk to someone else or, or, or wait on them first because they share some cultural significance in terms of race that that's a microaggression against me and then within the community, we can see how post-traumatic slave uh, uh, syndrome affects our people in the fact that we devalue one another. How else can you explain the fact that it's easier for me to eliminate someone who looks like me, but if I come in contact with someone else, I have to think, I'm thinking about how glorified they are. Everything from the hair care industry to the media, we find these things. And so you have young uh, men and women of color who are presenting themselves with the contrived, C-O-N-T-R-I-V-E-D, a contrived sense of self, because historically they have been eliminated as having any relevance. And so if someone doesn't tell me that, hey, you a Sylvester man, this is how we act and this is how we take care of family, we believe in education and so on and so forth, in the absence of that, and I'm similarly situated with other young men in my community, what do we do? We make up these images of self and we lean on one another, pushing that forward, and then reality continues to slap us in the face. And so we find ourselves you know, going through the whole dilemma of what we just presented in, in this presentation. And so um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, but it's not just particular to us. Deborah said something early on about there's no way that a person who is a domestic violence proponent, a man who beats a woman is not affected by his what he's doing because he's going to pass that on. There's no way that a people, a civilization of people can bring the harm, not just to a particular people, but to the environment in the history of the world. We, the, you know, I'm going to be very specific with this here. Greenpeace, save the whales, all of these things here came about as a result of the pursuit of money and the annihilation, not just of human beings, but of the environment too. This had an effect on us. And so, you know, you can look at it. I, I, um, I just hope that everybody continues to look into this here and explore it further. Next question. <laughs> okay, there's, there's a bunch of them. Okay. Uh, so here's the next one. I'm starting to think about asking my clients who are people of color to share how they feel about my whiteness, to acknowledge the elephant in the room and allow them to share about their historical trauma. So I think that there's, you know, what are, what do you think about that? About how white clinicians um, should be addressing that there are racial differences. Right. <laughs> and so as Baya was saying, we do need to get innovative. We do need to get creative. And how is that, how is that going to go back and forth? Is the, is the therapist going to share as well? Because again, this whole humanization of the relationship, I can't really fully share with you if I don't feel, believe that you see me as a human being, that you are able to, to, to be human with me. Uh, and that relationship is so important. I'm not asking what you and your partner are doing to bed at night, okay? That ain't what I'm asking. But just to show me that you are human, 
that you care about your own soul first then you then the, I, I can believe that you have the capacity to care about mine you know and so and and understand that and, and i don't i don't know how anybody can walk into a therapist's office and trust just like that okay then there are other barriers so then i got to get past your whiteness because again understanding what i have been taught in my world in my community about white folks okay and so you have to show me differently, just like I have to show you, because you've been taught that I'm threatening, intimidating, angry, violent, all of that. So we have to get through all of those, that misinformation and miseducation about one another. And if that is a way to do it, yes, you I'll tell you about what I believe and feel about your whiteness and you tell me what you've been taught about my blackness you know and then maybe we can get to some therapeutic something thank you um there's a, i'm actually i have a question about something that baye said i think in his portion of the presentation which was adaptive behaviors that are survival mechanisms and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that, because I think that we, we you know, the judgment piece, uh, I think from the a white person's perspective of um, interpreting behaviors uh, from a pathology as a pathology or as criminal. Um, and what I heard you say was that we need to think about them really more as adaptive and how have these behaviors served uh, in some way. So I'm curious if, if you could just speak a little bit more about that. Well, um, what, what I'm trying to convey is this, is that in the absence, in a land of where you feel as though you're rudderless and that you're locked out of the opportunity to be where your expression is validated and that if I am not emulating you, then some way I am wrong as an individual because I'm not emulating the dominant society. And so when I'm locked out of that their reality, I have to find a way. And so, but because of these stressors, I, I might take on this maladaptive behavior. And this maladaptive behavior is a, a, a way that has, has come in because I've been socially, I've been emotionally, I've been mentally, you know, incapacitated. And so my judgment is impaired. Everything around me, I'm, I'm in survival mode, so to speak, okay? You may look at me and you may say, oh, you have such talent to do this and this and this. But if I'm in what they talk, they, what in Myslow's hierarchy, they talk about um, being in this stress moment, in the tyranny of the moment, I can't hear you. And if this becomes, you know, my constant, the constant thing that I'm faced with. If as a child, I'm moved around from place to place. If in my environment, I'm constantly dealing with, you know, uh, hearing um, noise and voices being raised and that's followed by physical altercations, then it's, 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 it's just um, illogical to think that I'm not going to, and somehow if I associate someone ring, uh, raising their voice, then I have to strike out. And so when I'm in, if you put me in a school system and then you, I'm acting what I consider to be in survival mode, which is normal. And then you tell me, well, little Baye, I need you to settle down. But in my, the environment I come from, if you're not threatening me, hitting me, then I'm, I'm, I, can't, I can't really hear you, okay? And so what I'm, what I'm also trying to say is this here, and this is critical. What is near to me is dear to me, okay? What is near to me is dear to me. And so you may say, the dominant society might say, well, you have the opportunity to do this, this, and this. We have these programs set up for you and stuff. But when I'm in my immediate environment, the people who are nurturing to me, the folks who are feeding me, who are aiding me when I'm sick, I hear them. And if what they're doing is not approved by you, the fact that they are near and dear to me, that's what's imprinting on me, okay? And so what this post-traumatic slave syndrome brings forth 
is that all of these maladaptive behaviors that we see in the community, born out of contrived sense of self, alienation, and the lack of community control, the lack of community control, not uh, the city administrations, not some councilmen who may or may not be a part, immediate part of my community, saying you ought to do this or you ought to do that there. It's the fact that within my household, it has become the norm for me. And everything that I might personify within my household and outside of my household, it may be my norm. And I'm saying that it, my norm may not be normal, but it has become my norm because it's the way I've survived. Thank you. There have been a couple of questions about um, just your organization, Imani Unidad, and I think, you know, how do people within the community partner with you? How do we, you know, um, just look for ways to, you know, educate ourselves uh, and be, you know, supportive um, of the work that you're doing? So could you, would it be okay to just talk a little bit about Imani Unidad and just describe a little bit of what, what you all are doing and how, you know, if people want to um, connect and hear this presentation or bring this presentation to their organizations, how would they do that? So, anywho, uh, so Imani Unidad has been around for 18 years. So uh, Imani uh, is Swahili for faith. Unidad is Spanish for unity. Uh, it is by faith that we do what we do. <laughs> and, 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 that, and I don't mean that faith in a religious context either. You know, it's just faith in humanity, in the goodness of folks, you know, and, and, and unity. The more uh, collaboration, the more unified we are as a people, the better the outcomes for everybody. So that's, that's the name. You know, and again, the, the legal name is Imani and Unidad. So it's Swahili, it's English, and it's Spanish. So again, it's about all of us. Okay, okay. But our intentional focus is on the Black community. And when I say the Black community, it's inclusive of Brown and Indigenous peoples too, because we all live that same story, that same his history. And so uh, we provide both individual and group level services here. We have therapeutic counselors. Um, we uh, have group facilitators. We have, we believe in a harm reduction model, the inherent value of each and every human being on this planet to be self-defined and self-determined. Uh, and that's what we support. Uh, uh, we do a lot of advocacy within the community because we understand the institutional harms. And so when somebody comes to us, it's not only about helping them to get to wherever they want to go, but it's also trying to change, alter, do something about those harmful things in the community. You know, so it's kind of like working really hard to bring more and more supportive housing to this community for active substance users, this whole housing first model, harm reduction. What can I do to help you to stay health, safe and healthy today? Uh, uh, yeah, so that's what we do. And so we are open. Again, the Unidad, the unity, we are open throughout my personal history, throughout the history of the organization, we have partnered with dang near everybody in this community. I'm seeing Deb Lane, girlfriend, my namesake. Hey, <laughs> we go way, way back. You know, NIMBY, Cushion, you know, the whole. So we have a lot in common with, and Brady, Brady, I was just talking about Brady trying to partner with him. We both do outreach, street outreach, you know, bringing our services together. Isaac, you know, I just was telling the state today, me, Brady and Isaac, we all do street outreach and the need for us to be better together. So we, to have our, our night, our weekend services all doing that together. So yeah, that's, that's what we're all about. You know, there is power in the people. You know, the people with like minds uh, coming together. And we've just proven as a nation, there is more good <laughs> on this planet, more goodness in us people than there is for that crapola, okay? <laughs>
<laughs> Thank oh, you so. A lot with the, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, we work yeah. a lot with the University of Notre Dame, IUSB, because it is important to us that we supplement academia with practical life experience and that education that you ain't gonna never get in the classroom, okay? And we keep our own library on human sexuality, black, brown, indigenous peoples, all of that, you know? So, and women, uh, girl power, yes. So anyway, I get excited, so you better take it if... <laughs> <laughs> Deborah and Baye, thank you so much for your presentation today. I, you know, it's just so important, um, and I we're happy to have a, a a way to communicate to the community. Um, I know that you're doing it in lots of ways, but I, I really appreciate being able to partner with you uh, for today. So thank you, um, and thank you to everybody who participated. Please look for your evaluation link uh, that I'll send out. Um, there was a question about whether or not the PowerPoint would be available, and I wanted to ask you guys uh, if, it, if that's okay to send that out. Yes. All right, yes, yes. Please do. Where you at, okay. Keisha? I can't see Keisha, but Keisha, somebody asked me the other day about uh, what makes this the most rewarding or something like that, but I just saw Keisha who I guess I've known since she was knee high to it. There she is, knee high <laughs> to a cricket. <laughs> and so to be able to see these young people to grow up and remember and hold, you know, and take to heart the teachings and use them for the, you know, in their own best interest, ain't nothing better than that, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much.